targets the U.S. mainland. South Korea's defense ministry reassures the public that it's closely monitoring the North's activities. Ahead of the first session of North Korea's newly elected parliament set for next week, leader Kim Jong-un reportedly visited Samjiyeon County. We tell you what this could mean. South Korea's three big mobile carriers celebrate the launch of the world's first commercial 5G services. South Korea's exports continue to struggle with February's surplus in the goods account, dipping to the lowest level in more than four years. News Center begins now. Good evening to our viewers in Asia and hello to others watching from around the world. Welcome to Arirang News Center. I'm Noh Adam in Seoul. And I'm Han Daun. Thanks for joining us. Rival party lawmakers are showing mixed responses towards the results of the April 3rd by-elections, which are considered as an important barometer to measure public sentiment. Two parliamentary seats were up for grabs and the results saw one seat for the main opposition Liberty Korea Party and one for the minor Justice Party. We begin with our Kim bo -gyan. Both constituencies are in Gyeongsangnam-do province. It was a win for the minor progressive Justice Party in the district of Changwon Songsan, while the district of Tongyang Gosong went to the main opposition Liberty Korea Party. The ruling party was disappointed after it failed to pick up any new seats. Floor leader Hong Young-pyo said the party humbly accepts the results, but on the bright side, claimed they got double the votes they did in those districts compared to the general election in 2012. Although we lost in Tongyang Gosong, the number of people voting for our party nearly doubled when compared to the 19th general election. I want to applaud our candidate for trying his best. The main opposition Liberty Korea Party, which fared relatively well, said that the poor results of the ruling party are a reflection of the current government's performance. The results show that the public is not willing to sit and watch the Moon Jae-in administration's self-righteousness and arrogance. It's the public's way of demanding a change in policy. The Justice Party, having grabbed another seat, seems even more motivated to push for political reform. By allying with a minor party for democracy and peace, it will be able to form a negotiating bloc in parliament. That's because combined the two parties will have 20 lawmakers, the minimum threshold. That will give them a greater say in legislative affairs and create a four-party system in the National Assembly. With neither of the two largest blocs securing a full win, it remains to be seen how the parties reshape themselves before the April 2020 general elections. Kim mo Arirang News. Seoul's defense ministry reassured the public that it's closely monitoring the nuclear and missile movements in North Korea. This came in response to claims the North is continuously developing missiles as a backup plan when things go south or as leverage in nuclear negotiations with South Korea and the U.S. Defense ministry correspondent Kim ji for us tonight. South Korea's defense ministry said on Thursday that Seoul and Washington are closely working together while meticulously monitoring North Korea's nuclear weapons and missile facilities. This is in response to a report citing a U.S. military commander's claim that North Korea had produced intercontinental ballistic missiles that could be ready to be used in combat. U.S.-based Radio Free Asia reported U.S. Northern Command and North American Airspace Defense Command General Terence O'Shaughnessy had submitted a written statement for a missile defense hearing of the Senate Armed Forces Subcommittee on Strategic Forces, claiming that North Korea had already successfully tested an ICBM that could attack the U.S. mainland in 2017, and that Kim Jong-un's announcement of the end of the regime's development of such missiles right after the test suggests the North could use the missiles against the U.S. if a conflict arises. Intelligence authorities in Seoul also confirmed North Korea could have been restoring its missile facility. At a National Assembly's Intelligence Committee hearing held Wednesday, Seoul's Defense Intelligence Agency and the South Korea-U.S. Combined Forces Command confirmed that North Korea was working on rebuilding the Dongcheng-Yi missile launch site before the Hanoi summit. 
The agency said they thought at first North Korea was planning to invite foreign reporters to the site should the summit had borne positive results, but added the restoration work had continued even after the summit fell through, suggesting North Korea was trying to use it as leverage in nuclear negotiations. They added they wouldn't jump to conclusions that the site has been restored to an operational level, though, saying a critical factor, the placing of a crane at the launch pad, has not been reinstated. But the Combined Forces Command says it's also not ruling out the possibility that Pyongyang is seeking to resume nuclear weapons development. Kim ji Arirang News. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un made his way to Samjiyeon County recently, a place he visits every time he has to make major political decisions. And with the first session of the North's newly elected parliament coming up next week, eyes are on whether we will find out Pyongyang's strategies on denuclearization talks soon. Our Unification Ministry correspondent Oh Jong-hee tells us more. Showing signs of deep contemplation, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visited Samjiyeon County for the first time this year, Pyongyang state-run Korean Central News Agency reports. Samjiyeon County is the symbol of Kim's yearning for national prosperity and the North Korean people's well-being. North Korea aims to finish developing the county by 2020. Seoul's Unification Ministry says Kim's visit to the county is meaningful, as it's his first visit to an economic site this year. But it's not only that. Kim Jong-un has visited the county whenever he has needed to make a big political decision. And that's why his trip there raises a question. Will the North lay out its post-Hanoi summit strategy soon? Next week, Pyongyang is holding the first meeting of its 14th Supreme People's Assembly, North Korea's parliament that was newly formed last month. Eyes are on this meeting because the assembly has the authority to revise the constitution and decide on North Korea's domestic and foreign policies. Seoul's Unification Ministry says that the North could even hold a major policy gathering within the ruling party beforehand. The results of these meetings will show which direction Kim Jong-un will take on denuclearization and economic development. And until that direction is known, Seoul plans not to rush its inter-Korean project. After the Hanoi summit fallout, Pyongyang has been lukewarm in communicating with Seoul, and their joint projects in a variety of fields are now on hold. Pyongyang didn't respond to Seoul's suggestion to hold military talks, and it also didn't answer Seoul's invitation to join the global railway meeting next week. Seoul says for now it'll wait because North Korea will have to wrap up its domestic political events like the Supreme People's Assembly next week, and South Korea has a summit with the U.S. When things are sorted out through these events, then South Korea will seek ways to resume inter-Korean projects with the North. Oh jong Arirang News. Since the collapse of North Korea-U.S. talks in Hanoi, U.S. officials continue to up the pressure on the North, saying sanctions on the regime need to be toughened. But Seoul's top nuclear envoy says sanctions alone will not work. Lee ji has more. Though sanctions can have some effects, Seoul's nuclear envoy Lee do says sanctions by themselves cannot fundamentally resolve the North Korea nuclear issue. North Korea has persisted nuclear development through decades of sanctions and pressure. To believe that stronger sanctions and more pressure alone would make North Korea suddenly give up its entire nuclear program is an illusion. During his speech at an expert discussion on the Moon administration's Korea Peace Initiative on Thursday, he said efforts to resume dialogue need to be continued, despite skepticism, limited time and mutual distrust. He also said, though the top-down approach between Pyongyang and Washington is one of the key factors for success, there needs to be more working-level discussions. He said one reason for the collapse of the Hanoi summit is that the officials could not fully fine-tune the core issue of denuclearization and its corresponding measures before taking it to their leaders, so Kim and Trump didn't have enough time to close the gap on the specifics. And once the much-anticipated talks resume, he said the two sides must obtain early results, large or small. 
This is also in line with what the presidential advisor Moon jong in said at the discussion, that a priming measure is needed to help build more trust between the two sides. And I hope the Chairman Kim Jong-un would allow the international inspection of Punggye nuclear test site. That would be one, one of very positive you know, first moves. And I would, I would say that that kind of activities would give a very positive, you know, that, would, that kind of activities would send a very positive signal to uh, Washington, D.C. Can uh, I would argue that the President Trump can reciprocate uh, to North Korea's you know, first moves. Moon said a partial lift in sanctions such as giving the green light to inter-Korean projects, like the reopening of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, could be a possible reciprocal measure. But for that to happen, the special advisor said, President Moon Jae-in will have to put in a lot of effort to convince the North to agree with a comprehensive agreement and to persuade the U.S. to accept a step-by-step -step implementation. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Seoul's Defense Ministry says it is waiting for approval from the commander of the UN forces to go ahead with new hiking trails for civilians near the DMZ. It plans to open the tentatively named DMZ Peace Trails later this month, but in the meantime, the UN command is apparently into the idea. We have been working closely with UN command from the planning level, conducting field inspections to prepare. UN command has been really positive about it. We are now waiting for official approval from its commander. The ministry added on Thursday that it's doing everything it can to ensure the safety of visitors. The South Korean government announced its plan yesterday, opening the restricted area to civilians for the first time since the signing of the Korean Armistice Agreement in 1953. Korea launched the super-fast 5G network for a number of mobile subscribers on Wednesday, followed by U.S. carrier Verizon. The close race has generated some debate on who was the world's first to genuinely launch the next-generation network. Also Young has the details. Korea is now the first country in the world to have 5G mobile subscribers. The nation's three major mobile carriers, SK Telecom, KT Corporation and LG U+, launched the super-fast mobile network at 11 p.m. on Wednesday, Korea Standard Time, two hours ahead of U.S. carrier Verizon, which introduced 5G to two cities. The race was tight, with telecom firms from both sides moving up their launch dates to claim the world's first title. However, with access to 5G currently limited, the real question is who gets the bragging rights? In Korea, the network's nationwide launch for the general Korean public will take place on Friday, with the simultaneous unveiling of Samsung's 5G handset, as well as 5G-optimized services like video streaming apps. Meanwhile, Verizon's coverage is restricted to certain parts of Chicago and Minneapolis, and the available Motorola handset needs a separate add-on module to enable 5G. 5G service is based on three aspects, an optimized handset, infrastructure, the network of base stations, for instance, and media content. In that sense, Verizon offers a very partial 4.5G service with the Morola handset. Even if it had launched its new services earlier than Korean carriers, Korea should be credited with launching genuine 5G services for the first time in the world. Also, Korea's mobile network will run 20 times faster than LTE at 2.7 gigabytes per second, while Verizon is offering typical 4G speed, which could peak up to 1 gigabyte per second. But rolling out the services first is only a symbolic victory, according to experts. What's more important is providing quality services. Think of a motorway that has stretched from 4 to 16 lanes. The hardware is there, but what about the cars that can drive along the roads? Korea and U.S. mobile firms are both lacking sufficient 5G-optimized content and services to offer their users. To help enhance user experience and enjoy the super-fast network at its fullest, Korean telecom companies are unveiling video streaming features for sports and entertainment and launching unique services such as a 5G robot restaurant. Oh Young, Arirang News. 
Now, some more bad news on the local economic front. South Korea's exports are continuing to struggle, growing inventories of semiconductors and low demand brought February surplus in the goods account to the lowest level in more than four years. Kuo Ni has this report. The goods account records a country's goods transactions with the rest of the world by subtracting the amount of imports from exports. And according to the Bank of Korea on Thursday, Korea's goods account marked its lowest surplus in more than four years in February. The account had a surplus of around 5.5 billion U.S. dollars for the month, down from 5.7 billion the previous month. Export dropped by 10.8 percent on year, their sharpest decline since 2016. The central bank attributed the low export figure to poor chip sales, which account for roughly 20 percent of all outbound shipments. Over the past few months, unit prices of semiconductors have dropped due to low demand and high inventory levels in data centers. According to DRAM Exchange's report back in February, contract prices of DRAM products across all major application markets decreased by more than 15 percent on month in January. A separate report added that inventory levels have kept climbing since the fourth quarter of 2018, and most DRAM suppliers are holding around six weeks' worth of inventory. Another reason for the smaller goods account surplus is a drop in petroleum products exports. A rise in competition from the U.S. and China in the petroleum sector contributed to the fall. And the central bank also pointed out that the slowdown in China's manufacturing sector negatively affected Korea's exports. Korea's current account, which includes trade and services, was in surplus for the 82nd consecutive month. The services account deficit fell to around $1.8 billion from a deficit of $2.6 billion a year earlier. This was due to an improvement in the travel account after an uptick in the number of visitors from China and Japan. Koruni, Arirang News. The United States and China kicked off a fresh round of negotiations in Washington on Wednesday, local time, in hopes of bringing an end to their trade war. They have reportedly agreed on trade pledges, but apparently suggested different timetables for implementing them. Kim Dami has the latest. The United States has reportedly set a target date of 2025 for China to fulfill its trade pledges as the two countries kicked off a fresh round of negotiations in Washington on Wednesday local time. According to Bloomberg on Wednesday, the proposed pledges include purchasing more U.S. commodities such as soybeans and allowing 100 percent foreign ownership for U.S. companies operating in China. While the U.S. reportedly noted possible retaliation against China if the pledges are not kept, China supposedly suggested 2029 to fulfill the pledges. In hopes of hammering out a comprehensive agreement to bring an end to the trade war, U.S. President Donald Trump will meet Chinese Vice Premier Liu He at the White House on Thursday local time. The Chinese vice premier is in Washington for trade talks with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer this week following last week's talks in Beijing. After the Beijing talks, White House economic adviser Larry Cutlow said the trade negotiations were progressing and they hoped to get closer to a deal this week. Cutlow added they made good headway in Beijing last week, where China acknowledged the problems of intellectual property theft, forced technology transfer and hacking for the first time. If the talks are successful, President Trump and Xi may get together to sign a final agreement to end their protected tariff dispute. And people familiar with the plan said the meeting date between Trump and Xi could be announced as early as Thursday. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Several more lawsuits brought today against Japanese companies by South Koreans forced to work for them during World War II. Representing the victims, the lawyers for a democratic society and the Center for Historical Truth and Justice said Thursday the cases involve 31 plaintiffs. They're suing four Japanese firms, Nippon Steel and Sumitomo Metal, Nachi Fujikoshi, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, and Nippon Coke and Engineering. This is the first case involving Nippon Coke. Each plaintiff is demanding up to about 88,000 U.S. dollars in damages. In two similar cases last year, the South Korean Supreme Court ordered Japanese companies to pay compensation for unpaid wages and abusive treatment. 
Prosecutors have raided key buildings as part of a probe reinvestigating sexual assault and bribery allegations involving a former Vice Justice Minister Kim Hak Lee. On Thursday, investigators confiscated evidence from some 10 locations, including Kim's home and the office of Yun Chung Chun, a building contractor suspected to have bribed Kim with sex services. Also raided was a digital forensic center of the National Police Agency that first investigated the case back in 2013. This comes just six days after the special probe into the case was launched last Friday. After analyzing the data seized today, prosecutors are expected to summon those related to this case for questioning, including Kim and Yun. In English football, Tottenham Hotspur have finally played their first match at their brand new stadium. The stadium was almost two years in the making. And the first Premier League goal on the new pitch was scored by none other than South Korean striker Son Hung Min. Won Jung Hwan has a story. At the end of the day, it was worth the wait. Initially scheduled to open at the start of the season, the 62,000-seat venue had endured issues with safety systems, forcing the team to continue playing games at their temporary home of Wembley Stadium. But on Wednesday evening, the home supporters finally experienced their team play a match in their new home. After a series of celebrations to mark the opening of their new 1.3 billion U.S. dollar stadium, Spurs overcame a nervous first 45 minutes in their new home to record their first Premier League win since February 10th. The first goal came some 10 minutes into the second half. And the honor of scoring the new venue's first goal went to South Korean striker Son Heung Min. It was Son's 17th goal of the season and one that will go down in history. In an interview after the game, Son said, it's just amazing and couldn't hide his joy, mentioning about the scoring the first goal at the new stadium. Son's teammate Christian Eriksen added a second goal as Tottenham earned a vital 2-0 win over Crystal Palace to pull them back into the league's top four. Having not won in the league for nearly two months, the club hopes that the new surroundings can provide renewed impetus as they fight for a top four finish. Won Jong-un, Arirang News. This spring, the royal palaces in Seoul are running some special events, such as historical reenactments. And they've opened up some spaces that are usually close to the public. One event is the Royal Culture Festival. Our Lee min Sun went to a preview and files this report. While the king inspects his royal guards and watches their training, assassins suddenly appear. The king's guards take their sword and protect the king with their martial arts skills. This dramatic scene is part of a special preview event held at Gyeongbokgung Palace on Wednesday night. Some 150 people were invited to get a first look at the Royal Culture Festival scheduled to kick off at the end of this month. Organized by the Cultural Heritage Administration and Korea Cultural Heritage Foundation, the one-night premiere event presented seven highlights from the festival's 40 programs. The Royal Culture Festival opens up palaces that contain 500 years of Joseon Dynasty history. This year, we are opening more palaces and have unique programs for visitors, like hands-on experiences. Wonderful moments await if you join the festival. Back for the fifth year, this year's festival focuses on creating an immersive and interactive experience for visitors to not just stand and watch, but to take part in the program. Visitors can feel like they traveled back in time to the Joseon dynasty and even pretend to take the test that scholars had to pass to become government officials. The highlight of the night is a musical performance at Gyeonghwaru Pavilion, where the king used to hold banquets. Dancers with a touch of modern technology dance to traditional tunes, a performer sings while gliding across the pond on a boat, and a dragon appears to wrap up the night's event. It's not easy to get into Gyeongbokgung Palace at night. I came because I wanted to see it while it was dark, but it's so beautiful and it's beyond my imagination. 
I found out about the Royal Culture Festival this year. I was excited to see and experience what programs are lined up. I really enjoyed the Royal Guard inspection and the dragon appearing at the Gyeongeru Pavilion performance. This festival had drawn some 2 million visitors in total over the past four years. The Royal Cultural Festival will kick off with an opening event on April 26th and last until May 5th. And if you turn up wearing hanbok, you can enter the palaces and participate in some programs for free. Im Min-sun, Arirang News. Parliament's Education Committee is officially urging Japan to correct an elementary school textbook describing Korea's Tokto Island as Japanese territory. In a resolution today, lawmakers expressed regret over Tokyo's approval of the textbook, demanding that it be withdrawn. They also called on Japan to stop infringing on Korea's territorial sovereignty and vowed global efforts against such moves. The resolution will be sent to Japan's Education Ministry as well as the Foreign and Education Ministries in Seoul. Last year's average pay per worker jumped to the highest level in seven years to nearly 3,000 US dollars a month. The Labour Ministry data says it was an on year rise of more than 5%. The increase is mostly thanks to a higher minimum wage. Two more children of Korea's richest families now in trouble with the law. Roy Kim, a K pop singer whose dad founded a rice wine company, Booked today by police for spreading illegally taken photos in a growing sex scandal involving other musicians. Kim's agency says he'll be back soon from the United States where he's studying to face questioning. Also today, an heiress to a famous dairy company detained for her suspected drug use and for having her family pull strings to prevent her arrest two years ago. South Korean footballers Lee Gang-in and Cho hyun woo have been included in the Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia. The list picks leaders in Asia under the age of 30 in 10 fields, including arts, finance and industry. A midfielder for Valencia, E is the youngest Korean in the Spanish league. And goalkeeper Joe with Tegu FC rose to fame for his performance at last year's World Cup in Russia. That's your three-minute news flash. News in depth coming up next. Japan has unveiled the name of its new imperial era this week, ahead of the emperor's abdication set for May. While interpretations on the new name Reiwa vary, much attention is being drawn to the incoming emperor Naruhito and his foreign policy directions. Today, we discuss in-depth on Japan's opening of a new era and the possible effects on Korea-Japan relations. For that, Chairman Kim Sang-woo of East Asia Cultural Project now joins us in the studio. Thank you for coming in today. Thank Thank you for having me. Let's start off by diagnosing the current Korea-Japan relations. It's no secret that mm. the two neighboring countries' relations have gone somewhat sour following a, a, a series of diplomatic rows, ranging from compensation issues regarding Japan's wartime forced labor to uh, low-altitude flyover by Japan's patrol aircraft. Mm -hmm. How do you assess the current Korea-Japan relations? I think it's the lowest of low. Uh, as far as I can see. I think the, pr the uh, cause is uh, responsible, responsibility of this is on both sides because Korea, we're both caught in the past. We are prisoners of history. Korea continues to demand compensation, apologies. Japan says, enough is enough. We've done all the apology and compensation that we deserve and therefore we would uh, no longer comply to that. Now that has made serious uh, problems because no, uh, what, each side is not working towards resolving this issue. Right. What they are doing is blaming uh, each other mm -hmm. that the, fa the fault is on their side and therefore uh, the attitude towards having an improved relations for the future is only in rhetoric. There is no movement towards that direction. And I think this is a very, very serious situation that we face at the moment. 
I think prisoners of history, as you put it, I mm -hmm. think it's a very simple and clear uh, way of expressing how Korea-Japan relations are now. Now, to adding fuel to this, Japan recently proved, approved elementary school textbooks mm -hmm. that renewed false territorial claims on South Korea's easternmost Tokdo Island. Now, it's been an annual event for mm -hmm. nearly a decade, but what is Japan's motive behind the false claims every year? Well, actually, I personally think that the way we dealt with this problem was uh, not the correct way. We are in act de facto control of the island. We do not need to react every time that uh, Japan makes a claim on something that we already occupy. Mm. We should have not uh, complied with the way that Japan was consistently and persistently trying to make this an issue. We should have stuck with being it a non-issue. Now Japan wants to take this to the International Court of Justice, which is something that we should never do because it, it is uh, undoubtedly, Tokto is our territory. But at, to the uh, Japanese new text has changed. There's a change in, in one context. They, in the past, said that the territory was theirs. But now they say the Tokto is a native territory, which means that Tokto belonged to Japan all along, which is something that we actually can contest because before 1905, and in many cases in the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, even Japan acknowledged that Tokto belonged to Chosan. Mm. So my feeling is that what we should have done was to quietly and consistently gathered evidence mm. and made a, a, a claim and address the international community, mm -hmm. academic uh, organizations, the media, in a quiet way, not, mm -hmm. not so uh, loud and, and boisterous mm -hmm. like the Japan wants us to be doing. So in that sense, I think low key is better mm -hmm. for us because we already occupy Dokto. Mm. So it's not very wise to make this issue too big of an issue. But the National Assembly's Education Committee today has adopted a resolution uh, demanding Japan to correct its elementary school textbooks regarding its false Tokdo claims. Could this be a viable solution to this years old problem? Uh, politicians are politicians. They always try to uh, impress the public saying that they have uh, done something to uh, appease or, or to appease the uh, public sentiment. Of course, Japan will not comply. Right. Yes, they, they will stick to their uh, position as they've done. The, the situation will prolong. Uh, it will for the foreseeable future. But mm -hmm. I think that what we need to do is mm -hmm. get the international community on our side. So mm -hmm. quietly gather materials, mm -hmm. gather evidence, mm -hmm. and continuously uh, approach mm -hmm the academic community, mm -hmm. the media, uh, governments, and try to gain their uh, approval. The diplomatic friction also seems to be affecting Korea-Japan economic relations. President Moon Jae-in also during a meeting with foreign investors last week assured Japanese investors that economic exchanges should be dealt separately from political issues. How do you see the effect of the diplomatic rows on Korea-Japan economic relations? Well, the business leaders since 1959 have met every year. But this time, they have postponed that meeting, although it was scheduled to uh, take place in May in, at Lotte Hotel. They have scheduled, postponed it uh, beyond September, which would means that it may not even take place. The only two times that this meeting, this conference, this gathering, had been um, not held was under uh, na natural di uh, disaster when East Japan had its earthquake, and when we had our impeachment last uh, in 2017. Those were the only two times in the 50 years that the e uh, economic leaders did not meet. So it is a serious situation. And although President Moon has said that he would separate politics and the economy, 
up till now, that has not been the case. And in a way, it is understandable because this year is the 100th anniversary uh, in March. It's the 100th anniversary of the 1st of March independence movement. Right. And uh, this month, we have the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the provisional government of uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. So the mood in Korea is very anti-Japanese, mm -hmm. I would say. And therefore, uh, relations to improve will have to wait. We'll have to wait. Judging from that, Japan also appears to be taking this very seriously. Now, moving on to Japan's new imperial era, Japan has unveiled the name of its new imperial era ahead of uh, emperor's abdication set for next month. The name Neiwa is now being interpreted in various ways. Mm -hmm. What's your take on the new name? Well, one thing that is very uh, interesting is that this name, or this era, new era name, was uh, selected from the old ancient poem of Japan. The other er names of uh, eras were all taken from Chinese classics. So when Abe adopted this, I was, he reminded me of someone being similar to Trump, Japan first. He is very much uh, gaining uh, popularity and support and approval within Japan due to his strong position and stance against Korea right. and also other it's, countries as well. Right. So he is enjoying this uh, 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 current popularity for maintaining his uh, government and his prime ministership for, uh, for a number of more years, I, I would imagine. Now, much attention is focused on the incoming emperor, Naruhito. Could you tell us about his stance on South Korea-Japan uh, relations? Do you think the beginning of Naruhito era could serve as a turning point uh, to the soured Seoul-Tokyo relations? If he's anything like his father, yes, because uh, the emperor Akihito has several times made, uh, uh, sent his message of apology. And I think uh, the son, the new emperor will also uh, take that position. So it can be a kind of uh, a, a breaking away from this current uh, stalemate into something more positive. Hopefully, hopefully, um, the, the royal family or the royal uh, family will continue to uh, uh, gain the support of uh, Abe government. You know, the LDP and Abe government is uh, main, su mainly supported by the Japanese League. And this Japanese League is actually uh, sponsored by the 80,000 Shinto Association. And the Shinto Association, the head of that, the symbolic head of that is the emperor. So it is very important for the Abe government that the, uh, the emperor and the royal family supports his government mm. as well. That's a very interesting fact to learn. Mm. Uh, we have an important summit coming up while preparation is well underway for South Korea U.S. Uh, meeting for the summit between President Moon and Trump uh, next week. The Trump administration is putting emphasis on uh, the importance of South Korea U.S. Japan trilateral mm. cooperation in resolving North Korea's nuclear issue. How do you assess the significance of the trilateral cooperation in breaking the current nuclear impasse? Well, the trilateral uh, relationship has been crucial to the U.S. Uh, position in Northeast Asia. It is, uh, and, and the U.S. is very concerned because of the souring of relations between Korea and Japan. And they come to a point where they are trying to directly intervene. Uh, the U.S. Congress uh, cross-party uh, adopted a resolution uh, uh, declaring that uh, the trilateral relation has to uh, be even stronger and Korean-Japan relation has to improve. So they are taking it very seriously. And the U.S. also, w when uh, Pri uh, Foreign Minister Kang and uh, the um, Secretary of State Se Pompeo. Secretary, yes, Pompeo met, they made uh, sure that the so-called the trilateral relations is strong and that the commitment to cooperation is uh, s strong as well. 
And I think when Yi Do Hun, the uh, rep special representative for the uh, uh, North, Korean North Korea affairs. affairs, met with Began and on his way home, he stopped over at Tokyo to meet with his counterpart in Japan. And I think this was something that uh, actually the uh, Began and the American side has uh, asked to be done. It, it is. Uh, speculation is that some, some um, Americans have uh, uh, said that at the summit meeting, it's quite possible that President Trump might ask Pres President Moon directly, what are you going to do in order to improve relations with Japan? That question might be raised. This is someone that uh, uh, speculates that this may take place. This is how serious the U.S. looks at the situation at the moment. Well, it sounds like the problem is more serious than we think. Thank you, Professor, for your time today. Thank you. It is that uh, time now in the newscast to take a look at some of the digital media content available on Alidang's website and social media platforms. And today we'll be looking at a company that is aiming to make hearing aids more accessible by lowering prices. Take a look.보청기 보급률로 봤을 때 20%가 최 되지 않는 수치라고 저희는 생각하고 있고요. 보청기에 들어가는 핵심 부품의 요소들을 스마트폰 자원으로 연동한 블루투스 연동형 증폭 회로를 개발하여서 라이센스 비용을 줄일 수 있었고 유통 구조에서 파격적인 변화를 가지고 올수 있었습니다. ผู้ชมกินได้ผลิตสีย่อพอนเราสร้างชีวิตมันจะได้มาเงินก่อนเถอะผู้ชมกินได้ผลิตสีย่อพอนเราสร้างชีวิตมันจะได้มาเงินก
Flowers are blooming all across the nation and seems like now it's Seoul's turn. Yes, the very uh, strong winds are currently blowing across the country. So if you're out looking to attend some flower festivals, you better hurry. For the latest update on the weather, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather, weather Center for us. Michelle, what's the latest? Well, guys, the cherry blossoms are in full bloom in most of the country, especially over in the southern regions. And in fact, all regions will see their cherry blossoms to open by next week, which is still earlier than usual. And Friday, the wind makes its exit out of the peninsula, and also there will be intervals of clouds and sunshine above Northeast Asian countries. A mild morning is expected across the nation. Seoul starts off the morning with 8 degrees Celsius, while Jeju hits into the teens. Highs will mostly reach into the upper teens, whereas Daegu and Gyeongju it's up to 21 and 22 degrees, respectively. With warm conditions, frequent sporadic showers are in store this weekend, so please make sure you plan your weekend accordingly. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. And that wraps up this edition of Arirang News. Thank you as always for watching. Yes, and we'll be back same time tomorrow with more domestic and global news updates.